Today I want to talk about intercession and the call to intercede. Because uh, in, in, in such a time as this, this is what God has called us to do and commanded us to do. To intercede in behalf of nations, to intercede in behalf of those who are sick, to intercede in behalf of our brothers and sisters, of course, to intercede in behalf of our uh, our, our medical uh, practitioners who are in the front, the front lines right now, and also to intercede in behalf of everyone who are struggling today, those who lost their jobs, uh, who, who are also um, uh, struggling in fear uh, because of this pandemic. So we are called to intercede, and this message is, is a call for you, the church, and for everyone who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to intercede. And so let's talk about intercession. So we are called to intercede. And by the way, if you are, uh, if you have access uh, to the Facebook page, all the notes, the notes for this message is on our Facebook page, the church Facebook page, and and it's under notes. So so you can uh, look at the the verses in there as well. But I'm going to try my best to also show all the verse, verses here. Uh, on screen. So what is intercession? What is prayer for intercession? A prayer of intercession. So so prayer or intercession, prayer of intercession is praying on behalf of another person or praying and on behalf of others. You know, prayer we know is defined as simply communicating with God. It is talking to God and and pouring our hearts to God. Uh, you know, one example of a prayer is praise or thanksgiving or, or petition, personal petition, meaning asking things from, from God. These are, these are different kinds of uh, prayer. However, intercession, it's also prayer. But I believe, and what the Bible says, is that it is more than just prayer or communicating with God. It's more than just communicating with God. And I want you to look at this passage in Ezekiel, uh, verse 20 to 30. We're going to go back to this passage later on. But if you have your, your Bible, also follow with me. Uh, get your Bibles ready because, uh, because uh, there are passages here that I'm not going to post on screen. So, so you have to open your Bible, Bibles yourself. So get your Bibles uh, ready. Uh, Ezekiel 20 to 30 says, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. To stand in the gap. God is calling at this point in time in the nation of Israel, God is calling someone to stand in the gap between him and the nation of Israel. God is calling someone to plead, to make a petition. Uh, before him in behalf of the nation of Israel or in uh, on behalf of other people. Uh, in one definition of intercession, uh, if you go back to the original language uh, that was used in the New Testament, this is what it says. Intercession is the common point between heaven and earth. Intercession, uh, when a person intercedes, it is the common point between a holy God and a sinful humanity. You know, if you go back to scriptures, looking at the Old Testament heroes, in, um, looking at the Old Testament heroes, um, you find people like like Abraham, or or Samuel, or Moses. These are heroes of faith, but but they were also intercessors. The heroes of faith were intercessors. Abraham, for instance, you remember the account of Abraham when he interceded in behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he asked the Lord, Lord, don't destroy any of the cities. Did you know that there were actually five cities? It's not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but there were other, other three cities, five in all. And he interceded for those cities and asked the Lord, 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 uh, are you willing to, to discontinue the destruction of the city? Uh, if there are a righteous people in the city, and, and, and the Lord said, yes, I'm going to 
this continue, the destruction of the cities, if there are righteous people in there. Sadly, there was not even one. That's why all those cities were destroyed. But Abraham interceded in behalf of those cities. He interceded in behalf of, of the, those lost people in, in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Moses was an intercessor also. He interceded in behalf of the nation of Israel. Uh, we're going to look at Moses later on. Go back to him uh, later in the message. Samuel is also an intercessor. There was a point in time in Israel's history where they were being, you know, uh, being defeated by the Philistines. And, 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 the, and the nation of Israel asked Samuel, Samuel, will you, inter will you intercede before God? And, and, and of course, Samuel interceded before God and God, with, by, through his miraculous power, sent a, a, a loud thunder that caused the Philistines to panic and, and to be in fear. And they were defeated by the Jews or the Israelites. So intercession of this of this uh, man, well, they pleaded before God in behalf of others. They pleaded before God in behalf of their nation, in behalf of on behalf of lost people. Even modern heroes, people that God used in in recent years, they were also intercessors. Modern heroes of faith. Just give me. I'll just give you one example. His name is James Hudson Taylor. You heard me mention his name many times. He was the founder of China Inland Mission. Today it is called OMF, Overseas Mission Field. And it was founded, China Inland Mission was founded in 1865. And through his ministry in China, more than 100,000 people were won for Christ. And he was an intercessor. This is what a Hudson Taylor said. He said, it's possible to move men through God by prayer alone. He had tremendous faith in God through prayer that, that he believes that people are moved by prayer alone. And, and, and you can see his dedication to intercession that he would wake up at two in the morning to start praying. Imagine waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning to start praying because he knew the impact of intercession in the lives of other people, in the lives of the entire nation of China, in the lives of, of those people whom he ministers to, and, and of course, lost people. He knew the impact of what the impact of intercession is, which we're, we're going to look at more today. Uh, another hero of faith, uh, E.M. Bounds, he said these words, Talking to men for God, talking to men for God, let me move to my slides, this is what Hudson Taylor said, and, and this is what Ian Bounds said, talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to men for, the talking to God for men is greater still. So it's a great responsibility when we talk to God in be, on behalf of other people. The second point is that intercession is commanded. It is commanded to all of you, my brothers and sisters, to us believers in Christ. If you open your Bible to this passage found in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, I would like to show you a few things found in this passage. And so do open your Bibles if you have copy in front of you. And let me read to you 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 4. Paul talking to his, uh, to his uh, protege, uh, Timothy, a young pastor, this is what he said. I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayers be made um, refer, requests and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
come to the knowledge of the truth. And this was the verse that Anne also alluded to earlier uh, when she was uh, introducing the service. And if you go back to verse 1, we are told to intercede. We are called to intercede for all people, for all men, to pray on behalf of, of all people. You, you, we are called to pray on behalf of the church, to pray in, on behalf of other believers, non-believers, to, inter, to intercede on behalf of those who are serving the Lord, to give them good success in their ministry, uh, to, to pray on behalf of the, of the nation, uh, uh, to bring about repentance and salvation for those who are lost. But you notice in the following verses, we are also commanded to pray for our political leaders. In the, in, in Paul's time, they were, they were, they were the emperors and kings. But today, these are the prime ministers or the presidents or the leaders of our country. We need to pray for them. We need to intercede that there will be peace in our country, that, that we'll live quiet lives. This is what Paul is saying here. And, and this is a good thing. Paul is saying that when we pray for our leaders, when we pray for our nation, this is a good thing and it pleases the Lord. Imagine when you begin to pray for your political leaders, whether city leaders, state or country, even, even international leaders, it pleases the God. It honors God. That's what this passage is saying. And, and, and he also tells us that, that when we pray, we pray for peace and quiet because when there's peace, the church is able to serve the Lord unhindered. The church is able to do her ministry without any uh, hindrance. You know, Jesus himself, Jesus himself was an intercessor, and he, and he is still an intercessor until this very day. In fact, he is an intercessor forever. This is what Hebrews 7.25 tells us, that therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, Talking about you, believers, followers of Jesus, those who come to, through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus continually, always lives to intercede for you. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is interceding for you this very moment. This is his, his one of his uh, responsibilities, being our Lord, being our Savior. Because the Bible tells us that he is our high priest, our mediator. And, and Jesus is a perfect intercessor because he is both God and man. And, and, and he perfectly understands God. He perfectly understands God's purposes and God's heart. But he also understands you very well. He also understands your predicament. He, he understands your situation because he was once uh, lived. Among, he once lived among us. He dwelt among us. He was a human being living among us at one point in time. So he understands our weakness. He is our perfect intercessor. He is the intersection between heaven and earth. He is the common point between a holy God and a sinful man. Remember the definition of intercession we have earlier. Did you know that Jesus, he is our Savior, he has this responsibility. We also have the same responsibility to be intercessors. When you, you are now born again into the kingdom of God, you are now made holy through Christ as Christians. You are not anymore of the world. And you belong to God. So you know God. You have the mind of Christ as a child of God, as a believer. Yet, you are still in the world. You still struggle with sin. You still struggle with the things of the world. We still struggle with our weaknesses. That makes us a perfect intercessor in, on behalf of the world. Because we know God, but we know what it means to be a human being what it means to be human. And, and this is why we are given this responsibility to intercede. This is what God purposed us to accomplish 
one of the things that God purposed us to accomplish while in this life, while we're still in this world. Now, to give you some idea or a glimpse of how what Jesus does when he intercedes for you in heaven, let, just, just let me give you a, a glimpse of that. And, and, and this time, I want you to open your Bibles to John chapter 17. And we're not going to read the entire chapter, but I'm just going to point out certain verses to give you a glimpse of, of what Jesus prays for on behalf of you when he intercedes uh, for you. For instance, in verse 11 of John chapter 17, this is what Jesus says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. You know, Jesus is praying for our protection. Jesus is praying for our unity, whether as a church, uh, river life, or, or the church as a whole, the body of Christ as a whole, every believer around the world. Yes, because he is talking about believers here in this passage, in verse 11. Also in verse 15, we, we see Jesus praying this prayer. He said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. It's amazing. You find What you find in this passage is that Jesus wants us to live a long life. He wants us to live a long life. He said, he said, Father, I don't, it's not that you take them out of the world. Don't take them out of the world yet. But Lord, protect them from evil. Wow, this is both a promise and an intercession. Because Jesus wants us to live a long life from this passage and also protection. And, and I believe that, that we will not leave this world until the task that God has appointed for you and me will be done, will be finished. For he who began a good work in you, remember the passage, he is faithful to complete it. He is faithful to complete. So so even though there's pestilence going on around the world, but if you are in Christ, not until God say so, says so, that you are now ready to go home, that will not yet happen. That will not yet happen. Only until God says, well done, my good and faithful, faithful servant, then, then we will go. Um, another passage found in uh, verse 20 and 20, uh, 21. I'm going to read this to you. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in, in, in me through their message. I'm talking about you and you and all of us because we believe God's message through the message of the apostles uh, and through the word of God. And so in verse 21, it says here, um, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. It's praying again for unity. What's amazing about this is that Jesus wants us to experience him, to enjoy him, to enjoy his presence. In fact, in this passage, Jesus is desiring for us to see his glory, to, to experience him in the fullness of who he is. In fact, he is excited for us to be with him in heaven. He is excited for us to see his fullness, the fullness of his glory in heaven. He is excited for us to, to enjoy heaven. Uh, that's one of the things he is praying in this passage. Another thing also, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. In, in Romans 8.26, I think I don't have the verse here. In Romans 8.26, we are told that the Spirit helps in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes, intercedes for us through words, wordless groans. You know, there are times when you are filled with grief and heaviness of heart that there are words, sometimes you, you don't have any words for your prayer. You don't know what to say and, and, and you don't know how to express your, your heart or the prayer of your heart. It is those moments when the Spirit simply intercedes on your, on your behalf. And he prays with wordless groanings, with groanings that words could not even describe. 
And sometimes your prayer becomes simply a cry. And that is the Holy Spirit praying through you. On behalf of you. So believers, my brothers and sisters, we are commanded to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. To be intercessor. This passage in John 20, 21 says, As the Father has sent me, talking about Jesus, I am sending you. The Bible tells us that Jesus is interceding on our behalf before the Father. But who are we supposed to intercede before on, on, on their behalf before the Lord Jesus Christ? The rest of the world. We are to intercede on behalf of the rest of the world. On behalf of others before our Lord Jesus Christ. As the Father has sent Jesus, Jesus Christ sends us. Sends us. We are called to stand in the gap between God, between Christ and the world. We are that intersecting intersection, the point of intersection between God, between Christ, and the rest of the world, and the rest of the people that God called you to minister. You are called to stand in the gap. And lastly, I want to talk about the impact of intercession. The impact of intercession. You know, in, in your heart, brothers and sisters, you might be saying you know, this afternoon, you might be saying, Oh, I'm just one person. How can my prayer make an impact in this world? How can my prayer make an impact in my in my city or, or in this state or in this country or in this nation or in nations around the world? Lord, you might be telling the Lord, Lord, how can my, I make an impact, Lord? It's just me. What can one person do? What can one person accomplish, Lord? There are millions of people around the world who are struggling, Lord. There are millions of people who are, who are suffering, who are sick. There are millions who are, who, are, who are in fear right now, anxious right now, Lord, losing their jobs. Lord, there are many who are, who are uh, in, in the medical field right now who are putting their lives at risk, Lord God. Lord, what can one person accomplish? What can my prayer accomplish, Lord? I'm just one person, O oh God. The truth is, the truth is that you cannot accomplish this on your own strength. But with God, you can. With God, you can. This is what us Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, he is one of, he's considered one of the greatest preachers um, in, in modern history. And, and this is what he said, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Your intercession is the slender nerve, it's like a fine thread that will move the all-powerful God to intervene in the lives of others. Even millions of people. Yes, you cannot do it alone on your own strength. But an all-powerful, omnipotent God can do that work. Can accomplish that work. And if there's one thing I want you to get from this message, is that you will, out of this message, after this message, is that you will not underestimate the impact of one intercessor, of one person praying for the world, of one person praying for the nation, that you will not underestimate the impact of one person praying for the entire city of Austin or for an entire community of people. And in closing, I want you to consider two examples from the Old Testament on how one person, just one person, can impact Millions and millions of people can impact an entire nation. Just one person. The first passage is found 
in, in Exodus 32, 9 to 14. And this is the passage that uh, uh, Ethan read earlier. Uh, and, and if you have your, bi your Bible, uh, do open the, this passage, uh, do open to this passage. And I'm going to read to you um, this passage. But before that, let me give you a con the context. You know, the Hebrew people, the Jews that, that uh, Moses led out of Egypt and into the promised land, they were a rebellious group of people. They complained. They, 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 they grumbled against God. They worshipped idols. And, and at one point, God planned to destroy the entire nation of Israel. He planned to destroy his own people. And, and think about this. There were probably around 2 million people, 2 million people around that time, 2 million Jews in the desert, in the wilderness. And God was planning to destroy this entire nation. But God never destroyed, never did, did what he planned to do. What changed? The God's decision. What changed the mind of God? It was the prayer and intercession of one man, of one person, and that person is Moses. Let me read to you Exodus 32, 9 to 14. Verse 9. Uh, I have seen this, I have seen this people. The Lord said to Moses, they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains, to wipe, wipe them off the face of the earth, to turn from your fierce, un turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Moses is pleading before God, turn from your anger, O God, relent, O God, do not bring disaster, O God, to these people. Was pleading and pleading before God. Verse 13. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that's Jacob, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Verse 14. And this is God's response. Such an amazing response to a, to a heartfelt prayer and the Lord relented and did not bring to his people the disaster that he had threatened. Wow. Prayer of Moses changed the direction of Israel's history. The prayer of one man like Moses changed that change the nation of Israel. That would have been the end of Israel as a nation. But they still exist until today because of the prayer of one man. Just to sidetrack a bit, uh, this is not, this is, I'm not going to take long on this point here. There is something about this prayer that, that, can, that teaches us what it means. It can teach us what it means to have an effective prayer before God, a powerful prayer before God, a prayer that, that where God responds, a kind of prayer that God responds. You notice in this passage that God relented. Prayers, the prayer of Moses changed, changed the mind of God. Yes, our prayers can change the mind of God and change how God deals with us. We know that God never changes. It is his nature. It is his purposes that never changes. But how he deals with you and me, how he deals with the world, and how he deals with his people and us, that can change. And it can be influenced by our prayer. 
as a response to our intercession, as a response to our prayer. So what kind of prayer that changes the mind of God? There are two things that you find in this passage, and I want to I just wanted to point this out because this is, I believe this is important. Two things that 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 change the mind of God. Prayer that changes the mind of God. Number one, his the request of Moses, the request of Moses glorifies God. Moses presented a compelling reason to God. God, hear my prayer, O God, because O God, this will glorify you. He made a case for God's glory. Now, when you pray, when you intercede on behalf of other people or the nation, will you be able to say these words? God, answer my prayer because this will glorify you. Can you make a case before God for His glory when you're praying? The request that you have, Right now, before God, any kind of request, any kind of prayer needs that you have. Can you tell God in his face, in front of him, boldly, Lord, I'm asking you this need. I'm asking you to answer this prayer because this will glorify you. This will glorify you. And I believe that if that prayer indeed glorifies God, he will positively answer your prayer. So. Consider this as one of, of the, we can say, um, things that God answers. Uh, he, these are the, the things that God expects from us when we pray. And He will answer our prayer when, when our request glorifies Him. Secondly, Moses made a case for God's promises. He reminded the Lord of His promises. His request was founded on God's promises. You notice in this passage, he, he went back to the account of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord God, you swore to your, to, by your own self to make your, make many descendants as numerous as the stars. This was a promise God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and Moses was, was holding on to that promise. In the same way, when you're asking God and praying before God, can you, do you have a promise of God that will back up your prayer? Is there a promise of God that can back up your prayer, that will support your prayer, that will, that, that, that where your prayer is founded on? And I believe that if there's a, a, a if your prayer can be backed up by, by a promise of God or, 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 or promised by the promises of God, I believe God will answer your prayer. So when you pray, consider these two things. Is your prayer, um, will your, will your request glorify God? And is your prayer founded on God's promises? Is it, can, can it be backed up by the prom, by, by promises of God? So I encourage you to pray like this because this is unlike Many of our prayers, and in fact, some of our prayers are not as interesting as Moses' prayer. You know, sometimes when we pray, we just ask, Lord, bless me, bless my family. Lord, give me this and give me that, oh God. But God, what, what he might be telling you is this. What is it that you really want? Remember, remember our message from three Sundays ago or, or Sunday prior to last Sunday. He is asking us, what is it that you really want? He is asking us to be specific the way Moses prayed. He might be asking you, what does it mean to be blessed? What is it really, when you say blessed, what does it mean to be blessed? And, and, and then he's asking you, will this prayer request glorify me? Will this Is this prayer founded on my promises? You know, because of Moses' prayer, the prayer of one man who pleaded before God, who, who made a case for God's glory, who, 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 who held on to God's promises, God answered his prayer. The Lord relented and did not bring his people the disaster he had threatened. I'm going to give you the last example. Moses' account 
is a is a good account. It's a positive account. This one leads to a different ending. Around a thousand years after Moses, during the time of Prophet Ezekiel, the nation of Israel was again in the same situation with God. They were living in sin again. They practiced uh, idolatry and, and, and all kinds of uh, abomination before God. And I'm going to read to you this passage found in Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 31. So I want you to open your Bibles again on, the, on that passage and let's walk through this passage again as we did before. Verse 29. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy, mistreat the foreigner, deny them justice. So, so Israel, in short, was again living in sin. No different than what happened a thousand years ago during the time of Moses. So, so they were, they were on the same situation a thousand years later. Uh, uh, living in sin, disobedient against God, and the same situation God was about to destroy them. Verse 30. But this is what God was asking. He was asking the nation of Israel for this. He said in verse 30, I look for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would have, so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. So I will pour out my wrath on them, consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their heads all that they have done, declares, declares the sovereign Lord. A thousand years later, Israel was still rebellious against God. The same, the same as what happened during the time of Moses. When God was about to destroy Israel during the time of Moses, there was an intercessor. There was Moses who interceded on behalf of the nation. And God relented from destroying two million people because of one man's intercession. Moses stood the gap between God and humanity between God and the nation of Israel. He was that person right in that gap. He is the point of intersection between God and the nation of Israel. Now God is calling again a gap stander at this point in time. Someone who's willing to be in that middle between God and the nation. But you know what God found here? He said, he said, I found no one. I found no one. And, and you know, this was the time when Israel was about to be taken by the Babylonians into exile. The Babylonians destroyed the entire nation. Uh, at this time, it was only Judah that was left. And the, and the Babylonians destroyed Judah and taken the entire nation captive into Babylon. Did you know that that could have been prevented? Even though it was prophesied, but God was willing to change that. Then look at this passage here. I look for someone among them who would build up the wall, stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land, meaning on behalf of the nation, of the people of Israel, so that so I would not have to destroy it. So I would not have to destroy it. Wow, God was simply looking for one man like Moses to stand the gap. And he would not have allowed the destruction of the nation at that point in time. But since no one was interceding on behalf of the nation of Israel at that point in time, the nation was destroyed. It took many decades before the nation was able to recover and return back to their land. In closing, I want to tell you that intercession is not just preparation for work. It is 
the work of mission itself. If you are interceding on behalf of lost people, on behalf of the nation, on behalf of those who are suffering right now through this uh, pandemic, you are doing a mission work that's far more greater than what you can accomplish physically on your own. You are able to accomplish much more for God than through intercession, through prayer, than, than trying to accomplish things alone on your own, with your own strength. No wonder Moses spent 40 days with God on Mount Sinai. No wonder all these heroes of faith, the, the, the modern heroes of faith, like Hudson Taylor, he would, or, or even, even Charles Spurgeon, and, and many of the other uh, heroes of faith that you know, we know about, they would spend hours and hours before God in prayer because they understood the impact of intercession in this world, the impact of intercession in the lives of other people. That when they pray, they give their all and they give their time. They want focus. That's why they wake up early in the morning without any distractions so they can focus in praying for others. They understood the impact of intercession. And if we really understand the power that comes from God through our intercession and prayer, we would pray. We would pray because it can accomplish so much. Someone said that what God what God can accomplish in a few seconds, what, oh, so, sorry, what God, what we can accomplish in years, God can accomplish in a few seconds through your intercession and through your prayer. So something that you're supposed to do for years and years, God can accomplish that in a few seconds because of your prayer and intercession. Because God is, is all powerful and he can do that. And God has placed himself under the law of prayer. And this is what E.M. Bounds. I'm, close, I'm closing with this, with this quote from him. From E.M. Bounds. He is, a, he is a hero of faith as well. And a person of prayer. A man of prayer. God placed himself under the law of prayer. He will do things through men. As they pray. Which he would not do otherwise. Man has the has the power by prayer to move God to work, in which he would not work if prayer was not made. Meaning, there are things, and this is backed up by scripture as well, there are things that God will not do if you're not going to pray. That's the truth. There are things God will not do on his own if no one is going to pray. We need to think about that. The nation of Israel has have experienced this firsthand. And you've seen this, seen this in scripture. 